13 Questions by Man Transcending Manhood in the Digital Age So that was Ed Lattimore. Um, I came across Ed via Twitter. Um, I don't remember if that was a guest that Darren had reached out to. And then when I took over the Twitter, like I picked up the conversation or if I found him on Twitter. But uh, yeah, I just shot him a message and uh, set up a time. After looking at his his website, he's got so many. He talked about a little bit about the books or the letters to himself uh, about you know being sober, getting you know being getting sober, and then uh, he's got stuff on stoicism up there. Um, the guy was a boxer. He's a chess enthusiast. So super interesting dude. I'm glad that we could have him on. Yeah, absolutely. If you're a boxing fan, you may uh, have heard his name. Uh, and yeah, really fun interview. I. I got to say my favorite question, um, in all of the bunch is, uh, the one that you asked and it was just, it was uh, the last bonus question. And that was phenomenal. Uh, my favorite answer to, to that, uh, one yet. So yeah, man, this was, you know, a lot of them are surprises and they shouldn't be, but, uh, it was just super, super pleasant and a fun conversation. The guy's got some really interesting and great perspectives, um, I always love people that have been into combat sports, you know, or things that have a lot of, of discipline and, um, just overall control over you yourself, because ultimately at the end of the day, you know, what's happening is, you know, your body moving in the way that your mind tells you to, um, you know, tools and machines not included, you know, they're just not there. It's you. So, um, yeah. Uh, having said that, uh, wonderful perspective. Really enjoyed the answers. Uh, and check out his, uh, be sure to, Ed, we'll have all this stuff in the show notes. Be sure to follow him on, on social media. Um, like I said, I got a hold of him on Twitter. Uh, 13 questions does have a Twitter. Although I don't, we don't really advertise it too much, but, uh, if anybody wants to follow the show, that is at 13 questions two, because, yep. The easiest the way, way to get a hold of me or Bill is link up in the Discord or send us an email, 13questionspodcastgmail.com. Easy and accessible. And if you uh, if you are on Gab or Telegram, we have those too. There's lots of memes over on Gab. I've been kind of slacking on posting those, but I have a feeling that'll pick up in the next few weeks. Um, let's see what else. We uh, haven't really talked too much about the uh, open source aspect of the show, but uh, recently I, I feel like, but we do encourage your listeners uh, uh, to su- suggest uh, questions. We had actually Carpo uh, suggested another uh, bonus this question whole that we were show able to use. Is open source. I mean, it yeah. started off with you know Darren yeah. Graham and a bunch of people, you know. Uh, putting their brains together for questions. It's expanded into new questions being added, people sending in their own interviews. So yeah, this is, it's, it's a living, breathing thing that you can contribute to. You can help with um, whether it is just uh, making a suggestion in a connection for us on the show, for us to, you know, bring this wisdom forward, or it's producing your own, you know, supporting us to keep the, uh, the lights on, and re- just replace stuff. I'm thinking about my stupid cable that broke the other night, which I ordered a new one on Amazon this morning. So, uh, quick tip: warehouse warehouse deals are the best. We can edit that out, but I'm telling you, Bill, warehouse deals are the best. Um, but yeah, support the show in any way that you can. I, I like the way that. Uh, um, Adam Curry says it time, talent, and, or treasure. So, you know, whether it's giving us your wisdom, you know, your insight into, um, what you felt listening to the episode or, you know, us putting in connection, you know, the audio or helping you produce or, you know, sending us the email, you know, keeping the lights on any or of the all above being part of the community and helping us move forward. 
uh, came up in a lot of the show, but you know, certain things you can't do it without other people and we can't do it for you without you and we need you. So we're here because you help us and we need your help. Bill, we need their help. Yeah. So guys, uh, value for value. If you can, uh, speaking of of that actually you know what this ties into my gratitude oh damn it no i was just getting ready to play it because it ties into my gratitude too gratitude 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 oh gratitude 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 oh gratitude Yeah, so time we were you mentioned time, talent, and treasure, and I have been meaning to mention this gratitude for a few weeks now because um, that guy, who is a past guest, not I'm just not saying that guy. Um, I forget which episode number he is, but it's it's probably around episode forty ish. So if you're a listener, if you're gonna go back in the back, back catalog and listen to that guy's episode, uh, he actually sent me i asked him uh, to do this actually but he which he did which is very kind of him uh, he sent me some specialized n i think there's nfc is the uh, acronym stickers and it, it uses your um, technology on your phone yeah Ooh, it's phone radio tag. frequency tags yeah. tag yeah there you go so you just tap you tack yeah you tap the tag and uh it'll link directly to a 13 questions episode uh, so, uh, since I was been, I've been, I've been interviewing people that are personal, you know, close friends of mine. And so I, I had five of those made, uh, for a f- like four or five, uh, different past guests. Um, shouldn't be that hard to figure out who they are because they're personal friends of mine. And then I, I mailed them to, to the past guests or, you know, close, close, close friends, you know, get what I'm trying to say. But uh, yeah, so that was just really cool for that guy to uh, to send me some free stickers and it helps promote the show. Um, these guys can put the stickers up wherever their you know their workplace or office or uh, I said you know I almost sent one to Eric Johnson. He's a firefighter, so he'll stick one up in the fire station. And, you know, so hopefully it'll be a little guerrilla marketing campaign for thirteen questions. Well, I'm 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 rolling right into yours because mine is exactly that. It's the support that we've been given. You know, it's it's the mixer that you have. It's the audio uh, program processing. You know, that's gifted to me that we get to share together. It's the donations that have made the upgrades and hardware and equipment and replacement of cables and different things possible and running the website and, uh, you know the it's going right back to the value for value, but it's we're able to do what we do because not only do people believe in what we do and want to listen, but they're willing to support and they're willing to help. And I am grateful for that. It's humbling's not the right word, but it's a very um, grounding feeling it's a very wonderful thing to be part of with all of you and yeah i hope it's it's reassuring to i think reassuring might be a good term just just because what i should be saying is i hope you enjoy episodes like this as much as i do because not only are you making it happen, but you're giving me the ability to make this happen. And in that we're all winning me very selfishly. You can be very selfishly. And I don't know. I just, I just love this idea of us making something together by supporting and not being beholden to and willing to inject and grow, um, and mold in whatever way happens, sees fit. I don't know. Yeah. The point is, thank you. I hope you enjoy this episode. Yeah, it's been, it is, I mean, it's this whole experience has been awesome. 
uh, with the interactions with all the guests that we've had, the ones that have chosen to give back and, and, and the people that have chosen to, to give back in some way to the show. I mean, whether it was Andreas with the mixer or you know, that guy helping out. I mean, yeah, it's, it's been a fun ride. You guys, uh, you guys might not realize it, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's been a big impact in my life too. So yeah, lots of gratitude flying around. Look at that. Hopefully you grab some wisdom from one of these episodes and, you know, maybe somehow through the annals of time, through another tens of thousands or million years, uh, it will still be there as a, a jewel of wisdom powering mankind forward. As long as the internet is a thing, no. we will be here. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, but the yeah, wisdom, yeah. absorb the wisdom now for when right. the internet is gone. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you will be the wisest man on the world. We need to, st- oh, man. The, it's no longer the, did you stay at a Holiday Inn last night? Did you listen to all 13 questions? Yeah, there's no way, like, there's, we can't, like, tran- transcribe these in stone or anything. We got to figure out. We need like 13 question guidestones instead of the Georgia guides. Let's take a uh, <laughs> note from the Voyager and do a gold record. Ooh, I like that. I like that. That'll be a, a nice, I don't know, man, that'd be so cool. Like, even if uh, the record, like maybe we could like turn that into a merch idea or something. I don't know. I don't know. Too many, too many thoughts flying through my 13 head. 13 question. Moment. We are going gold. Yeah, gold record. Maybe when we get to like a uh, hundred episodes or something, I don't know. <laughs> we'll figure out something fun to do. We will but, turn uh, our emblem gold. Yeah. <laughs> well, other Bill, than that, um, yeah. we oh we haven't mentioned the uh, Shanghai uh, yet. So if did you're we, in the market, we did mention Ed Lattimore's name, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um. Yeah. Oh, Shungite. If you're if you're in the market uh, for some Shungite, uh, we have an affiliate link on our website. So if you use that link uh, to buy Shungite or anything else from Mystical Wares store, uh, there's lots more than just Shungite there. Uh, we do uh, get a little bit back there. So it's just uh, some shared savings that we can pass along to the listener if you are so inclined. Yep. And I will say. You have made me a believer, but, uh, no, it was actually kind of cool. You were a customer, did an interview, you know, we decided to join the affiliate program and lo and behold, I keep buying stuff from them and I do enjoy their product. So, wow, that sounds kind of spammy. No, (laughs) check it out guys. Uh, Derek's been a past guest. It's episode 50. Um, he's someone I could keep in contact with uh, regularly. So. Uh, if you're into Shungite or just want to find out more about the man behind the Shungite store, you can listen to episode 50. Exactly. And support the show however you see fit. Time, talent, treasure. Thank you for joining us for this episode with Ed Lattimore. All right, Edward, uh, welcome to 13 Questions. Hey, thanks for having me on 13 Questions. You, uh, you ready for the first question? I am ready for the first question. What was the best advice ever given to you? Would you modify it at all today? Uh, the best advice ever given to me was uh, a friend of mine said, uh, when was this? This was probably 2009, 2010. He said, you know, you should just put all the drinking aside for a minute and see what I am, really stay focused and see where your professional uh, boxing career goes. And it's funny, I didn't take it at the time, right? um, but eventually I did. And my entire life is is 100 percent different. Because I, because I just eliminated an entire timeline while I'm battling 
hangovers and run-ins with the law and everything like that. And so, you know, I stopped drinking in, in 2012 and 2012, uh, 2013, stopped drinking in 2013. No, 2012 is the end of 2012. It, it, I'm starting to lose track and that's a good thing, uh, I guess. But oh, I, I stopped drinking. It was definitely 2013 because the Olympics were 2012 and there's a whole memory associated with that. So 2013. Stop drinking at the end of 2013. Haven't looked back, and and really, uh, it was because of that advice. He just said, "Hey, man, you know, stop drinking and see where you get in two years." My original plan was to do it for like two years and see, you know, because I was back in school and in the army and everything. And I said, "Let's see how far I can go," and and I was going so far. I was like, "Why would I go back?" And it really has has changed my life. But that's the best advice I got. You know, if you got a you got a um uh something you're trying to accomplish. Put the booze down. <laughs> so what made that advice coming from that person at that time, like the time that you would take it up and enact on it? Well, he was a good friend of mine. We had we had uh, and he was a friend I made through fighting. You know, uh, adults typically have a problem making new friends because they don't do anything. It's like after you get out of school, uh, all the people you went to school with, those are your friends because you don't engage in any social world social gatherings outside of work i'm I'm a lot different in this regard so i've got a whole set of friends that i made uh, when i started fighting i got a whole set of friends when i started playing chess i got a whole lot of friends from from now my, my writing and entrepreneurial ventures uh so i continue to make friends and it's really easy but with, with that with that said you know uh he was a friend i made in the fight community and i watched him he got sober he stopped and his life improved. And this was a guy, I mean, we used to get like, I mean, we're talking like hammered. Like there was this place we used to go to called Nadine's. And we lived, we both lived in walking distance to it. We go in there, you know, with $10, $15 and, and can't even remember getting home the next morning. That's how cheap it was. Uh, so like to see him do that and then him make the recommendation to me to do it, uh, I carry, it carried a lot more weight. You know, uh, it was he wasn't somebody that didn't drink. He wasn't somebody that was still drinking. It was like, yo, you might have a problem. You know, I'm just gonna be like, yo, screw you. You know, you're drinking too. Like, no, he was somebody that was. You know, we we sat and shared the same bar stools, and he watched me make a fool of myself, and he really believed in in my my potential, and just said, hey man, you know, you should really think about this, and and I did really think about it. It took a while, but but I acted on it. <laughs> You know, that's good. Sounds like the marker of a true friend. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't get, um, true friendship much anymore. We, we get these very modified friendships today. And, and one of the things I think that keeps people from being as successful as they could be is that they don't surround themselves with the support system. And, and sometimes it's difficult. Like if you if you're coming from, you know, you were a piece of crap and you and then you wake up, yeah, there's gonna be this this lonely moment where you're leaving behind the old and walk, walking into the new. But when you find that that new, when you get somebody, when you see somebody uh who who really makes a good piece of gives a good suggestion to you and you know uh, it doesn't matter who the person is, like the advice would be good. It just happened to come from somebody that you know and trust who's looking out for you. Uh, that makes your life a lot easier. It makes it much easier to build these bonds and these friendships. And I think I think a lot of adults today, especially millennials, millennials got it the worst because oh, we feel it the worst. I'm, 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 you know, just just I can see uh you um i think i can see no i can't see you but i'm I'm guessing you know maybe you're not a millennial but uh millennials i think suffer from this in particular because we we did grow up in this this era where we bonded there was not screen time there was not zoom there was not skype there was not texting there was not social media we we went outside and played we met up we kept appointments because we had to be there and then the transition happened and it happened when we were all in college mostly in that that age range early or early 20s and so now you know not only did we never develop the skills it's even harder now <laughs> to, to meet people because now it's a, it's a whole new world where where they I won't say their skill set is optimal. Well, I think it's with Generation Z or whatever, but um, they 
have a different way to communicate and stay in touch. You know, it's, it's a weird way, but, but I think at the end of the day, you still want, you still want good friends. You still want people that, that you can uh, listen to. They, 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 you that earn the respect and the reputation uh, that you listen to them that are good people because a lot of times people want to surround themselves with people who enable their worst instead of bring out the best. What do you choose to ignore? Oh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> Almost everything. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I have no shame in telling people that I don't, I don't vote. I don't really know about pop culture beyond what comes on the radio. Uh, and that that's if I'm listening to radio most of the time, man, my, you know, my, my, um, my hot stations, I guess the, the, the ones you press the button in the car and it goes straight to my save and my presets. It's like all classical and like, um, classical. What What is that genre? I think, um, you know, whatever, like the Eagles and the stones and like, like soft rock, uh, yeah. like, yeah, that that's like the stuff I listen to because I, I don't, because I, I recognize something, uh, early on. And it continues to serve me well. I recognize that uh, my peace is my responsibility. And in anything I let disturb that, I need to assume a responsibility for it. And, and that means I need to be able to do something to alleviate what disturbs me because I'm responsible for my peace and what comes into my, my realm. I need responsibility over it. Well, a lot of these things that people get disturbed about, they 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 get the burden of the stress, but they don't get the control of or the agency to do anything about it. And that is that is a recipe for constant tension, and stress. There's like there's no way around it. If 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 the thing that bugs you, you can do nothing about, then then you're then you're always going to be bugged. I mean, me, I took a different route and I said, OK, uh, I can't do anything about the political situation around me. I can't do anything about and then now it's permeated in the pop culture. Uh, I, I don't watch I, I watch boxing when, when when especially when some of my friends are fighting. Um, but I, I don't I couldn't really tell you anything going on in sports. Uh, I like watching movies. That's like my thing. And, uh, and even now I'm getting into older movies. Uh, things that aren't really tainted with with the message that I find divisive and and not really and on top of that, I mean, a lot of stuff doesn't challenge you anymore. I read a lot. I got a great big old bookshelf back here in, in a weird way because I understand people will see me on the internet and I'm always I'm like oh, I am always on social media. Uh, I am I'm kind of a luddite in this regard, man. I don't uh, I don't really pay attention to much if it if it if it doesn't. Uh, make me more interesting or better you know so so i i ignore a lot like too much probably <laughs> but but you know i'm happy so whatever well you're also not distracted like everybody else is so you know ignoring... you know exactly you know well well i get distracted right you know i think i think that's that's certainly a symptom of of this highly connected era uh, the difference is that my distractions tend to be other things that are constructive and that I, and they're always things I can control, you know, like I'm, I'm likely to get distracted writing an article because I wanted to study a Spanish lesson or something like right. that. You know, it's not a, uh, I got distracted because I was arguing with somebody over politics or about the mask or something like, it's not going to, that that won't affect me. I, and I'll, I'll never let it happen because, because I was like, I was saying uh, before the show, I am, I am acutely aware for some weird reason. I am very aware that I, I don't have a lot of time on the planet, and I'm not an old man. But I know that, uh, you know, what the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Um, Earth's been around for not even a billion, I think, years, and uh, or, or just over a billion. I just remember the number. It's like it's like two or three some. Uh, and I, I will live at best like a hundred something. So I'm not really interested in wasting a lot of nonsense. You know, uh, if you, you can meet 150 people a day, which would be superficial interactions, but you can meet 150 people a day for the rest of your life and you wouldn't meet 1% of the people on this planet. So I, I'm, I'm going to focus on, on what matters and what, what I have control over and, and what 
fulfills me. There, there, there's a lot of stuff to to try and take away that, and I won't let it. What book has been most influential on your life and why? A Course in Miracles. Not even a, a question. Hear that? No hesitation, man. A Course, a course in Miracles. That book. Um, first of all, if you, if you, if you, um, you gotta understand something. Here's a side note before we go into this. I am a scientific thinker. I am, I am big on falsifiability. And if I can't replicate it or touch it, as far as I'm concerned, or, or prove it with a mathematical formula, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's probably hokey, right? So let me let me put that out there that I'm that guy. Um, with that said, I I recognize I'm not arrogant enough to think that that what we can perceive is the limit of what's out there, and that what we can do is the limit of what it's always going to be possible. I say this to introduce the Course in Miracles and how and what they say um, it is. So apparently, this woman. Uh, was possessed by Jesus and possessed is probably the wrong word, but that is the best word I have uh, possessed, possessed by, by Jesus. And he, he wrote this book through her and then she published it. And the whole course, the course in miracles is effectively a text on how to forgive because uh, what do they say? You know, once you forgive, you have no need for time. And when you have no need for time, then you'll be at one again. The atonement at the at one men is what they say. And and it's not it's not written to be a religious text. It's written to supplement whatever you you know, whatever your religion is. But but the whole goal is that, you know, we don't love one another. Our separation is symbolic of the love that we don't have. And so to get closer to that love, we have to forgive. We have to let things go. And in doing that. Then you move closer to unity with other humans, and eventually you won't need space or time because you'll be be unified. You know, and that 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 last part is kind of my spin on it with a physics with physics training. But um, TLDR, uh, that book changed my life because before that I didn't I didn't have um I didn't have a way to deal with what I felt were injustices in my life because when when you hold a grudge, um, when you want revenge. A lot of times what you're trying to do, what what you hope you can do is somehow even a score, but you can't do that. You can't undo what's done. Uh, you, you can't bring back anybody that was taken from you. Uh, a lot of times you can't get back what was lost. And even if you could, the, um, the vulnerability and the abuse of trust, you can't do anything about that. So you need a different way. And I think more people need to be trained in the art of forgiveness in general. That's what I, the, the, the next book, you know, if, so when I finish it, uh, that's what the next book is about, is teaching people a practical uh, way to forgive, largely inspired by what I learned in The Course in Miracles. That is super cool. I can't wait to read that book. Um, but specifically on forgiveness in general, I was thinking that it's most, like f- from my own experience, I've found that it's hardest to like forgive ourselves. for. Oh, absolutely. Like, for, and and once you reach that point, like you'll know it. Like for me, it was very clearly like clicked. So I was just wondering if you had any like. Well, oh, it, it's it's difficult to forgive yourself for the same reason why it's impossible to tickle yourself. You need a frame of reference uh, because a frame of reference is 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 what determines a perspective. And then this is this is kind of interesting, but kind of cool. It's like I like imagine an eyeball trying to look at itself. Yeah, I can't really do that. There needs to be some separation. Of, of what happens but but without that separation since you did the thing since the event happened um it's harder it's more difficult to change how you see things because that, because that's really what you do when you forgive if we want to like bring it down a level and make it practical what you're doing is changing how you you look at the past right changing your relationship to it well when you carry when when you're you you have to change how you see yourself and that can be very difficult for this you know and and we'll use an analogy it's like it's like if you live with somebody um uh, you live with a kid growing if you're not measuring on the wall one day you'll look up and they're, they're you know they're they're a foot taller but they were growing gradually over time somebody who didn't see them would have seen that progress but you you're with yourself the whole time and it's very difficult for you to to change and make these change these changes because 
uh, you or you, and you don't have another perspective. As far as my own experience with that, uh, one of the things I actually wrote about this in my book about sobriety, uh, several letters to my drunken self. I wrote about uh, one of the big problems that I had. I called it Angelus syndrome, and it named after Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the the uh, the uh, vampire angel. And he his story was that he was a vampire. He was a murder and killing son of a bee. And then a gypsy cursed him and gave him a soul. And so all of a sudden he can remember what he did, and he just felt bad and and scornful about it for all the whole time. And then he tried to help, and that that's you know how he got the name Angel and why it's part of the show. Anyhow. Uh, What happened when I stopped drinking is that I got to see uh, my behavior through a sober lens, the perspective. I got a real perspective on how I was acting. And then as I continued to grow and mature, uh, that perspective, uh, I continued to to gain a greater understanding. But and then this bugged me for a while. Like I would go into these, these situations just randomly out of nowhere for guilt. But the thing that changed it, the thing that that really helped is is I started to to look at where I am at now uh, emotionally and in terms of uh, how I communicate with people. I think it's a lot more open because I try to be more open. And I realized that but a lot, a lot of what I was doing, I was trying to cover up a lot of stuff that I wasn't ready to deal with. Okay. Uh, now, that does not ex- you know, excuse anything that I, I did or said, but it helps me understand it and that understanding helps me forgive myself because you know every people have forgiven me uh to the point where they don't even bring it up you know how it was you know the people who are around the people who are around and the people who, who decided nah they're gone it's not a big deal anymore in the external world for me it was and it was because i did not reach a point where i could where i could look at me and understand me but still be me but now i know i've you know i've changed and who i was was a person that didn't understand a lot and was dealing with a lot and you know so you have to understand yourself and you have to understand your behaviors motivations and then you can go back and deal with those but but as long as you look at it as just an act that you are saying you're still the same person with no progress the fact that you feel remorse is a good thing that is some progress but there's got to be more and it's the understanding you know why did this happen and a lot of times that that i had a friend who had a similar issue and she couldn't move past something and and a lot of times it's because we we don't want to uh, admit that we are victims we don't want to accept the weakness but a lot of times that explains why we did what we did what rule do you have for yourself that you never break, and why do you think that it is important? Rule I have for myself that I never break. Hmm. Um, I'm always polite. Uh, but <laughs> you know, I always I that that that's pretty much because I'm big on adaptability. So I, I don't have many rules that I don't I will never break. Uh, I mean, outside, like right now, I don't drink, but that's like a modification. But one thing I've always done, uh, I I try to meet every person with with respect, even when they're disrespectful, because a lot of times, man, you're just dealing with a hurt person um, or, or I'm reacting with my own issues, too. So to hedge against doing something that is irreversible or saying some words I got to la- later own and deal with. I've really disciplined myself to be controlled and disciplined, uh, controlled and polite, even in the face of of um, what looks like disrespect or looks like impoliteness or bad manners. And it, it just goes a long way, man. I don't I mean, f- first of all, I'm a I'm a I'm a probably a larger than average human being. So I don't really encounter a lot of a lot of ill will, but but we're in this day and age, people know they they can you know <laughs> hit you is kind of illegal, right? So so sometimes things fall off, but but that's the thing, you know. I, that thing, you know, I probably protected me when I was drinking because I have always, man, that politeness it makes a, a big difference. Just treating people well. If you can be, if you can treat people well, uh, your life is going. It, it won't be any harder. Uh, that's for like like treating people well never made anyone's life you know more difficult. That's for sure. Uh, so that that I, I say that's my rule, man. I always have, have manners, good manners, because yeah, you never know what situation, like what what, what you're walking into. Like, the other day, I was 
I don't know if this is a good example or not, but it made a, an awkward situation less awkward. I was coming out of a coffee shop. I had just bought a coffee with my debit card and a gentleman approached me and asked, was asking me for some money, but he was very polite about it. And he was very polite. I mean, I saw him do it to other people too. And he was just, you know, it just made it less awkward. Like, even though I had to tell him yeah. no, because I wasn't using cash. Right. But I'm sure he hears that a lot, but, it, but just the way that he came off and, 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 and of course, you know, I was polite too, back to him and everybody, you know, was agreeable about it. It, it, it just makes a big difference, especially when you're unsure of your, your surroundings or the situation in general that, you know, in that case it was in general public, but it can apply to anything. Right. Yep. Absolutely. If I were to ask your best friend, what is the one thing they would say you need to work on the most and why? Oh man, this is good. Uh, <laughs> I, okay. I think they would, would have said for a long time that, that I, I take things too seriously. Um, at, at a point for sure. That was a big issue for a while. And then, and then now, you know, the, we were just talking about things that, that I have control over and ignoring that. Um, I, th I think my friends would say I need to be a little less vain. Maybe that's, that's probably a big deal. Uh, yeah. The, and, and, and I think, I mean, not, part of me goes, Oh man, I've earned that vanity. Right. And the other part of I me mean, is still vanity. Right. Um, uh, but yeah, that that's a big deal. But because because here's my thing, man. Like I don't I'm I'm I don't have any problem uh discussing my successes. And it doesn't matter whether they're physical or monetary or, or not. I mean, I don't I don't have a problem uh, with it. But I understand that this, you know, tends to disturb some people, but I don't I don't have a, an issue with that. Uh probably that I, I yeah i mean even even now you know i don't i, I was thinking I mean, did, how much did that trait really go away to not taking things too seriously uh, it's not that i don't it's not that i take things too seriously i think sometimes that i am uh i i i i view the world as this once you take care of the hard stuff and the difficult and the challenging then you can have fun and be silly anyone who follows me on social media knows man but like at least 25 percent of this stuff is nonsense about, about crackheads and off-color jokes right um but that's because i feel like i'm taking care of the, the business and the rest of my life i have a very low tolerance when someone is around and they haven't taken care of certain things and they want to still be a fool you know that is and and now what i consider to be foolish that probably needs to be uh worked on a bit but other than that yeah i mean i, I think that's what they say some some one of those two things the vanity or the seriousness yeah that's a hard thing to separate though i would think you know just coming from a career where you know it is super serious like everything you know every move is serious and you know you know your name is you know a driving factor in what you're doing so i don't know it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition you know that yeah you know the, and and i've always you know what it's interesting you you state that i mean I, i've had this attitude even when i was in nothing i mean i'm, I'm just, it was just a, a certain conversation that just came to my mind when i was like 19 right but uh i i just i i've always hated the idea of not being taken seriously and so i try to avoid that in myself and then when when i when a person is is not that way but they're close to me but they don't take themselves seriously i'm like how do i like i have a very difficult time reconciling that then now that that's also tempered heavily by a live and let live policy as long as you don't hurt you're not hurting people uh i don't really have anything to say to you and, and you're not affecting my life you know once our, if somehow some way our fates are intertwined that's different uh which is, which is why i remember you know once i, I had to tell tell a friend i was like yeah, we can't ever be roommates again this was years ago but i was like uh you know we can't ever be roommates again you know uh because i care about our relationship more than i care about making you right so i'm gonna just let you be you and and we can still link up and hang but i don't ever want my my finances intertwined with you yeah, no, that that goes back to, you know, kind of being the the true friend, you know, hey, man, you know, it's just not going to work. Here's the news. It is what it is. It's because I love yep. you that I'm telling you. Exactly. It's not even a 
it's not even a malice thing, man. Like, like, uh, and then this is one of the cool things. Um, I, I think about about becoming a mature human is that you're you're able to go look. Uh, these are this is the boundary, and this boundary has to be drawn because this is more important than that to me. And and if we continue down this path, the the, the thing that I value will be put in jeopardy because then I got to do some of this other thing that I value less. You're making me make an opportunity cost decision that I don't really want to make. So let's just avoid this entirely. And, and if you got a problem with that, you know, then I know that, we, you know, we weren't going to be able to last uh, for very long anyway as friends, but there it is. <laughs> what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Um, creatively, I'm, I'm, I, I love a good story. Uh, that's, that's why my only hobby I say is watching movies, man. I just, just like, like good stories, um, stories where people, um, uh, typically people will have overcome something challenging, a lot of self-sacrifice involved, like two of my favorite movies. Uh, one of the themes is, is sacrifice, uh, what the heck is it? I'm a man on fire and and the fountain. They both have a theme of of sacrifice to 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 for the goal, the ultimate goal, a goal bigger them set than themselves, but they're part of achieving uh to take place. Same, same with Interstellar. You know, it's funny until you ask this question. I, I I never really thought about that, but I'm I'm thinking about all my favorite movies, and, and there is a a heavy theme of of self sacrifice. Very true. Um. As far as emotionally, ah man, nothing really. You know, I'm I'm not I'm not like a psycho, but like if I if, if you were like to type me and be like, yo, that guy's got some psycho tendencies, it wouldn't be like ah, uh, nothing really gets me excited. Uh, you know, no, no, that's not true. Gets me excited, man. I, I love watching my friends succeed. I was really excited, man. I had a buddy. He fought on PBC boxing the other night. And uh, I looked, I, I, you know, I hadn't been following his career much uh, because he was a, he's a journeyman. But I, but I, I saw that he was fighting this guy who's twelve and zero. His record's thirteen six and one. And I was looking, I was like, okay, they, they brought they brought him in to be the B side, whatever. But I went and watched the other guy's fights because I took took a few moments to distract myself. And I said, Johnny's going to beat this guy. And I text John immediately. I said, yo, where can I bet on this fight, man? Because you're going to beat this guy. And they, they've got to have you. Is this the B side on there? So you're going to beat this guy. Uh, you're, you're more experienced. You're his biggest, strongest, uh, most athletic opponent. And and your footwork is just is superior. And he went out there and he stopped him in the fifth round. And then nobody gave him a shot. But I texted him that. And I was very proud of that. I took a screenshot. And put it on on Facebook and Twitter, showing that it, that with the timestamp. Like I, you know, I was excited to see that. You know, I had another friend. He fought. We fought in the UFC. And he won his debut by knockout. Man, I was so excited. I, I was sharing everything. And when I typed it, I typed it with a typo. I, I do a lot of Twitter, man. I don't make that many typos, but I, I you know, ruin this thing with typos. Um, so I, I get real excited. Then this is positive, right? Now there's a lot of there are some things that bug me uh negatively. Uh wanton loss of life, man, for no reason. That I mean, there's never a good reason, but I can understand um like two people getting into it and that outcome ending tragically. And and even with bystanders, like like I, I understand that. What I don't what I don't understand, for example, uh is when that building collapses and in Miami and kills, I think it was 132 people. Uh, abuses of power really bugged me. It was one of the things that I almost got kicked out the army once because I watched an officer abuse his power to just cut in line at the uh, at the defect. And I'm like, here's the thing, man. To me, I enlisted late. I wasn't no no green eyed kid, man. I had to, I was 28, 20, I think 29 at this point. Uh, <laughs> I, well, almost 29. Um, and I'm saying, I watch this guy, and I'm like, man, if we was on the street, I'd fuck you up. And that was, that was my first <laughs> thought. But but you can't think that way, um, and you can't, and you certainly can't act that way. The criminal charge me, you got a problem. I you know I had to learn to shut my mouth. But that kind of thing, you know, really bothers me. As far as creatively, uh, 
creative you know i like to i i i realized very early on that while while motivation is really nice and you can create some awesome stuff while you're motivated if you only rely on that you you're not gonna have a body of work man so so i i stopped relying on how i feel to create a long time ago like like i understand like for example my website i think there's probably like 120 articles um maybe a little more and i'm and i know that just just get them out there there's just follow the process there's certain people i look up to i see what they've done and plus i know that I'm, and plus i know i've got tons of ideas in my head all i gotta do is sit down and, and focus for five minutes and something uh, will become galvanized in my mind that i can put to to screen i guess not paper we say paper i can put the screen and and it, and it usually uh works out that way works out well that second movie that you mentioned what was it called the fountain the fountain yeah man Is that's it, a that's an aronofsky film. Darren, Aaron, okay yeah man to... aronofsky is is fan um i have loved everything he's done uh what and i think off the top of my head i could probably name all of his movies man pa requiem for a dream the fountain uh black swan noah is that all of them i feel like there's something else in there it's all but, i know uh, of but yeah, man, he's great. He, yeah, outstanding. Uh, we got the same birthday. <laughs> but uh, he's a great, great dude, man. I love them. I love his yeah. movies. Just... And they're all great movies, especially The Fountain. If anybody hasn't seen it, go check it out. I recommend. Let me it. tell you something. There's only there. there I, I don't know which one I've seen more because I go through these phases where I just will we'll just rewatch a bunch. Uh, it's probably Man on Fire at this point. Probably. But I saw the fountain like five times in theater. And then when I then I owned it and then I would watch it whenever it was on TV. Um, but but Man on Fire, I only saw that twice in theater, but I watched that thing all the time, man. In fact, before I before I got my fiance now, we've been together now nine years. Um uh, I would that would be my my date movie in case the girl turned out to be a dud, you know. I would watch Man on Fire. I might have a good time make tacos because it's set in mexico watch denzel washington kick ass across mexico city it's a great time uh now i was just saying where we live now i actually have not watched man we've been here for a little over a year i've not watched man on fire in this um in this apartment we gotta i gotta fix that like asap have a good taco night here and watch it yeah it sounds like you need to cleanse the place <laughs> absolutely yep <laughs> What was the most embarrassing or humbling experience of your life? Ooh, man. Em- embarrassing? You know, I remember. See, I don't really get embarrassed. Uh, thank goodness, man, because I just I just ain't got it in me. Um, it's like I, I remember a teacher made me cry once when I was in the fourth grade in front of the whole class. I'll never forget it. Uh, I don't even remember what she made me cry about, I, but I do remember standing there crying like a little low you know weakling i don't know how 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 back i swear on the podcast but i was any I was, way uh, you want yeah man why 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 i sat there i was crying like a little bitch man i was i remember that uh in the fourth grade that was pretty rough um and then i don't know man and, I, and to put that in perspective like i remember in the ninth grade um somebody like uh, the teacher found this note I was writing to this girl, man. I thought I was being all smooth, and he read that in front of the class. Her face is all red. I'm just sitting there chill. Like I didn't mean embarrassment. I think once you get, you have a certain level, man. Or maybe I'm I'm a weird dude, man. Like I don't know. Don't really get embarrassed. I uh, the, the event. A lot of people think you know when I, even when I lost on TV, my first thought when I got knocked out on TV, like that was bad, man. Uh, my first thought was, man, I gotta pay my rent. Like I was just not. <laughs> <laughs> worried about it. i was like i was like man if they had waited if they because because they used to pay me uh a thousand dollars a month this part plus on top of uh my my purses and 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 the fight was the 23rd of september that i lost <laughs> and i said man if this was one more week because september is one of those one of them well one more week I got my money, but they they cut it. But yeah, my point is, even that wasn't like embarrassing. I mean, like I, I don't, um, 
after after that that event when I was in the fourth grade, man, it was like embarrassment was just resetting my brain. I don't have it. I don't I don't feel it. Um kind of burned it off, right? You know, you experienced yeah. it and it's like, ah, that nerve. Now you want now now humility though. Oh man. Uh got I got, got quite a few. And you know what's cool about being get become a humble? Uh something I realized. I didn't really have a lot of humbling moments. Um until I was like 28 and then they just kept happening. And I think, and what 28 happens, I call, I call my sobriety date, uh, my second birthday. And that's because that's when I really started to live. That's when I, I, I felt like the break was taken off of my progress in life. And, and not only was the break taken off that foot that was holding the break down, it was put on the accelerator. Okay. Uh, Humility, man. I tried to take four high level physics classes one semester, almost failed all of them, ended up with C's. I had to withdraw, take an extra semester. And I was real humbling to me because I, I thought I was a smart guy and I put a lot of work into it. And it just, and man, they were like, nope, you got to move at the same pace as everybody else. Like, like the advisor signed off on it, everything. I thought I'd be able to do it. And then I went and told her I was withdrawing. And she said, you know, I thought it was a bad idea, but I've learned it's just a lot better. I, but, but you wanted to try, so I said, I help you. And uh, it's just a lot better to do it that way. You'll learn it. And I did. And I withdrew. Um, losing my fight was, was a big humbling, not not humiliating, not embarrassing. It was just humbling because, uh, you know, okay, this is where my development is. This is what I got to do. You know, I, I should have put a little more into it and got it got a little further. Um I went and taught. I was a tutor for a little while, and and it was a great experience. But it's amazing how you can forget some basic stuff that, like, you think you know. I, I just went re- and, and I studied physics in school, man. So I shouldn't be forgetting any basic math. Like, I have a brain for math, but like, uh. I some things I'd have to just remember and recall, and I would learn as much from them as they learned from me. It was a it was a wonderful experience, um, and this is why you know online whenever I make a statement and then in person, I have no problem saying I'm wrong. I, I think I think if you if you have if you have no problem admitting uh, when you're wrong, then then being humble does what it's supposed to do, which is make you grow instead of stunt growth a lot of people let let these experiences stunt their growth and uh and that's just not not what should happen because you you can only get so many experiences the idea is to kind of converge to this to this ideal human and we all you know though are put differently uh the path to the top of the mountain or the road to the top of the mountain takes you know many paths right many paths to the top of the mountain and whatever your path is, you got to make sure you, you get every single thing out of that. Otherwise, you might not get to the top of the mountain, man. There's people that are going to be, um, people that, that are going to be, you know, 60 with the mentality of somebody who's 20. And it's crazy. And, 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 and it's not, and I'm old enough now to where I can see it now, even in people who are like around 40. They still think like they're in high school. It's crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. No, we're nothing to force responsibility, nothing to force growth. And even if those things that occur, no receptivity towards the lesson. What is your greatest fear? How did you uh, overcome greatest it? Greatest fear. This is this. So this is great, man. So, so I used to be afraid of lightning, like big deal. In fact, let me tell you something. Let's go. Ahead, let's take it back a step. I used to be afraid of dogs. Now, I was afraid of dogs because when I was two, as a very vivid memory, my mom was pregnant with my sister. My sister's three and a half years younger than me. Not even three and a half, like three and a third. Um, and and it's a vivid memory, man. We was going to my aunt's house and, and these Dobermans came out of nowhere, man. It was a pack of Dobermans, man. They they fucked us up. I had to get rabies, still remember the rabies shot, all the like crazy stuff, right? Um, I was afraid of dogs for a long time. And then one day, you know, Somebody had a dog, man. It was little and it was cool. And now I was like, oh, I'm a lot bigger than this thing. Because when you two, like it takes a while. When you two, did, when, when are you taller than any dog you encounter? Most dogs, like by the time you're like 11, uh, that's when it happened. I was like, oh, I'm not afraid. And then, and then somewhere along the way, I became afraid of lightning. And I was afraid of lightning for a long time until I enlisted in the army. And I did my basic training in Fort Littlewood, uh, Missouri. And don't you know, this is crazy. 
uh, they make you do these things called these field training exercises. First one is is this this basic thing. Second one is an overnight rough march. Um, well, and it's not even overnight in the sense that it's overnight. It's just you you march to a place and you sleep there. And the third one, uh, the third one is it's like it's like a it's like a twenty mile march, man, with full gear. And then you spend a week in the woods and, and you come back. All right, now now that's at the same for you. We're in the, we're in the middle of the United States. Where where that's tornado alley, man. That's that's where the real storms come. Mm-hmm. And and that day we marched, it was storming the whole day. We marched to the site, like the whole day. I and you know, you're out and up on cover or whatever. So I was like, you know, and that was just one incident of many marches under lightning laced, uh lightning speckled skies. So I got over that real fast. And if I wasn't sure about that, if I wasn't sure that I got over it that night. We got woken up and then we had we had different shifts. And when I finished my shift, I went back and tried to go back to sleep regard. But it was raining like nothing like 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 it was hard, man. It was hard rain. It was like not another ever seen. And it rained so bad. It was so it was such a storm. We had to we, we had to go sleep. We were ordered to go sleep in the tornado shelters. And I don't know if you ever had to, like, uh, go through an experience where you got to, like, seek shelter and a storm strong enough to where they're like getting a tornado shelter. I never seen this man. It was like constant lightning, like like the sky, like like, but it was like lit up. The sky was lit up in the, in the dead of night, and, and it wasn't like one off. One off it was just constant bright. And I have not. I've been able to walk outside and lightning ever since. Um, I'm not really afraid of anything. I just want to tell that story to just you know talk about what I was afraid of. Uh, nothing physical, anyhow. I mean, I I, w- I would prefer. Uh, not to die in a plane crash. I feel like that, but I, but I'll probably pass out before before I die. I prefer not to get drowned and burn, but I'm gonna die anyway. So I mean, I'm sure it won't be pleasant, no matter what it is. Kind of like by the definition. Uh, nah, man, I'm I'm not not afraid much uh, at all. I I don't uh I don't I'm aware that like things can go wrong, but I have I don't have any fears, phobias, man. I try to have you uh have you always been that way. No, Wait. no, I was afraid of the dogs, man. I was afraid of the lightning. Well, then how, uh, how yeah, where, when did the, uh, like the, just the overall fears just drop off? Was it just kind of the desensit- desensitizing to like super dangerous things? Oh, like- yeah. Um, yeah. The, the dog thing was growing up. The lightning was getting desensitized and I wasn't really like afraid of anything else. I mean, like, look, if somebody pulled a gun, I'm not going to be like, oh, right, let's yeah, play. Yeah. like, no, I'm aware of danger. But but in terms of like uh, constant phobias and fears that are in my mind, no, I don't have any of those. That's um, yeah, that's good. I'm I'm, I'm very I'm not, I'm unfortunate, man. Not everyone's like that. Like I mean, I, I'm the guy. I can look at myself getting injected, man. Like a lot of people can't look at themselves get blood taken. I didn't know that was like uh, not a thing that people couldn't do for a while, and that's just now you know, it is. So I'm really really fortunate uh, in that regard. What is your single greatest driving force in life? And how oh, do you further it? Freedom, man. I really, I I just, and, and freedom in all regards. Um, that doesn't mean I need to act on it, but I would, I would really like to not have to answer to anyone, to have to be anywhere I don't want to be. And anyway, here's what's crazy. I'm, I'm not a, I don't show up anywhere late. I'm, I'm over punctual. It's like a joke here. Um, uh, every time we got to go someplace, I try to get there 15 to 20 minutes early, no matter what it is, um, whether it be the airport or wedding or anything, I, I try to be as early as I can. I would rather be early than late, but I want the freedom to be late if I need to be or to reschedule or to do whatever I want. Uh, and so that doing, you know, th- that is what drives me currently. I really want to make sure I always have autonomy. The, the idea of being restricted, that, 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 that mean. That's the only reason why I try to make money. I think about too, because because I know intimately when we grew up really like really really poor, not just kind of poor, but like on welfare and the projects, poor. That's how I grew up, and then I spent most of my time as an adult, uh, pretty poor too. And I know what the restrictions, what those restrictions feel like, and I never want to go back to anything close to that. I don't need to be like 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 I I. I I say mostly serious that if I ever become a millionaire, it's going to be on accident. 
like, cause I'm not trying to make a million, but I know roughly what I need to live without having to worry about getting shot, having to eat, being able to eat what I want. But like, like, like one of the greatest feelings is, is whenever I want to go to a restaurant, I just go to the restaurant, man. Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't look at the menu at the time. Uh, this is all, all the prices. I just, just go. And that's a great feeling. I don't, I don't ever want to sacrifice that. Whenever I want to go someplace, I just kind of go right now. I'm not at the point where I can just kind of go on first class, but we're getting there. Uh, but after that, you know, what is my driving force? You know, wherever I want to go and wherever I, I want to be, that's kind of what, what, what I do. And I, that's what I want. But I, but I, so I want the ability to choose my restraints because I think you do need some restraints in your life. Right. Sobriety has demonstrated that to me. I mean, that's a restriction, but that's when I placed on myself because I saw a benefit. You know, now if I had ended up in prison because I, I ran somebody over some, well, that kind of made a mistake uh, and a big one, and it runs counter to my value of freedom. So, um, freedom, freedom right now is the biggest driving thing, and and every way I can create that possibly that's why i mean i lean towards all things passive or digital i could probably make more money like coaching and consulting man but then i gotta show up and coach and consult somebody and that takes time <laughs> time that i could be using to write or study or or work out or hang out with my girl or watch man on fire which i haven't done in a year <laughs> no i like yeah. it it's it's just uh making yourself free from a system so that you can you know you know, do as you need instead of having to be, you know, a tool in somebody else's toolbox to put food on your own plate. Exactly. And, and I have no problem, you know, for a cause or, or a purpose that I believe in that is not my own for being that tool, but I want to make that choice. There's a, there's a big deal. It doesn't matter what they pay me. If I, if, I have, if I have to take it, that's different. If I want to take it, that's that's not the same thing you know and i think i think too many people uh they 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 learn to make the necessity a virtue and i don't want to ever have to do that if, if i'm in a place you know i'm there because i want to be there now whether mm -hmm. there are at the very least at some point i consciously made that decision and and that was to get into it now if i get into something and it's rough I believe in honoring what you say you're going to do. So if I say it at some point in time, I want to do this and I get into it and I'm like, this sucks. I'm, I'm not, I, I won't walk like that goes against my, my principles, you know? So I try to, I'll stick it out. I'll do my best too, to be there because one thing I've learned, uh, once you're in a place that you don't want to be or doing something you don't want to do, uh, nothing makes it worse than not giving it your all. It's as counterintuitive mm -hmm. as that sounds. So if if I'm doing something and I don't want to do it, I know I just go bust my ass and I turn it into a competition. I turn it in, into a way to, to demonstrate excellence to myself. And, and in doing so, I add a bit of positivity to it. I like that uh, your point about uh, sobriety and relating to freedom, like, I've dangled with that demon too, and it just seems like number one, like you have more money when you're when you're not worried about Man, ain't drinking, that right? The truth. <laughs> and then uh, we're just talking about this today, actually, uh, not having to worry about DUIs, like right, freedom to travel, right? There was, like whole, there was a whole. Let me let me tell you two stories, man, related to what you said. The first one about having more money. Uh, first time I went to France, I was kind of not kind of I was broke. Uh, first time I went to France. I didn't realize it though, because everything was great. And turns out it was because I wasn't getting wine at every meal, right? Which is like something that happens. There's always some alcohol and there's always temp charge. And I was like, wow, this is what a great, what a cheap city, Paris. And my girl was like, ah, oh, she lived there and studied there. And she was like, oh, not really. Uh, it's just the way you you do Paris. Sorry. And then the second thing, man, we um we took a road trip. First time I my first time, like rightly out the country. I was still poor. Uh, so we drove, I don't know how familiar you are or where you are in the, in the, in the uh, country, but we drove from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Quebec City, Quebec, which is about two hours north of Montreal. It, was about, it took about 12 hours to do, but we're on the road. And you would have had to show your passport anyway, whether you, you fly in or drive in. And, and I, I'll never forget, man, I showed my passport and the guy checked it. And then said, all right, enjoy Canada. And drove him. And I know that you can't do that if you have a DUI. <laughs> You're not going to Canada. Uh, 
And so it was one of those moments where I was like, man, that's cool. And I, and it, and it just kind of reaffirmed, uh, my choice. Not that like, like at that point I was, I think, well, what that was, I almost two, I was almost three years in. I was, I wasn't going back at that point, but like this is those little things you don't have to worry about. We, we were at a, we were at a wedding. We were at a wedding. Um, this was, this was the, the year I went to Portugal the first time. So 2017, we were in a wedding. And, and people at the end of the night, man, it was, got drunk, got a little out of control, but we were already in bed. <laughs> so so I, I don't know what happened. And we were in bed because I wasn't trying to stay up and drink. And I wasn't trying to, you know, engage in the nonsense, man. You get rid of that that, that alcohol. You you get a lot. And you know what's crazy? A lot of, and this is probably somewhat odd or tangent, but whatever. Here we are. Um, it, I don't think people realize the cost of alcohol because we because ha- it's legal and because it's legal we justify it think about how many 20 somethings people turn 21 and that's like a rite of passage to go get like obliterated blackout drunk and like when you when you like learn what that actually does to your body you like i was horrified that that i tr- put my body through that that type of uh, punishment. I just got a blood panel done. I got the liver of somebody who who never drank because I haven't drank in eight years, and the liver is like a regenerative organ. But there are people that will never have that health and they'll die, or at least they won't have full health. And and the culture supports it. The culture is like it encourages it. And I, I just wish you know that, that if there's anything I ever try to do is, is and this is why I'm so vocal with my story with alcohol is that I try to lead as many. A lot of people just don't have anyone to talk. I, I, in fact, I know I didn't. I I didn't have any encouragement. Most of everyone I knew drank, and so um, I figure if I'm putting myself out there, somebody will go. You know that guy's pretty pretty cool, and he's got a big profile. He talks about this. I can do it too, and. And you know that happens sometimes. I get I get a lot of letters about that. Thank goodness. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. That's one of one of the many things that you talk about. And thank you for you know bringing attention to it because it's not really something that I hear being talked about a lot. It's outside of you know I'm not going to AA or anything like that. Yeah. But so you know, <laughs> but out there in general, yeah. So thank you. Hey, no problem, man. I'm very happy to do it. Who were and or are your role models? and why okay so growing up i did not have any role models and you want to talk about a thing that like hmm. can stunt the growth of a human uh it's that you like you need people to look up to i, I didn't have a stable house it sucked uh and and i didn't really understand how how much it set me behind uh when i was talking early in the conversation about about the forgiveness and, and why that was important for me to, you know, work through and process a lot of things in my youth. One of the things that happened, I was really angry uh, when I was 18. I became really angry because I had my, my story. I went to a high school uh, in my part of town. No, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I went to elementary and middle school in my part of town. So I spent the first, you know, what is that? Five plus three, like eight, 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 nine years of school with the same people from the same social and economic, economic background in the same neighborhoods, whatever, right? And so I didn't, I didn't know anything kind of but what I seen. And then I went to a high school. I got they have a magnet program here in the city, and I got accepted for this high tech thing. And so I went to a high school across town with a very different socioeconomic economic bracket. Uh, and I got to see, like, for the first time, a two parent household or uh, our family that like had like had a car like things like that uh lived in a nice neighborhood thing you know and i i, I didn't know it took a, it was a little bit of a social adjustment for me but one of the things that happened is i got real angry i got angry because i was like why would why would my parents have me and then not have any uh system set up for me to succeed because like when you look at it and here's the thing like, you know you're smart but you gotta have the emotions to kind of temper what you learn and when you learn what an at-risk youth is and you go wow you just drop me off in this system as an at-risk youth um you can make you angry made me angry it made me angry because i was smart enough to be around a lot of kids who who were where they were because of the support of their family and i was where i was because i just happened to be born uh intelligent all right and that made me mad 
but I didn't have anyone to really look up to when I was until I was 14. And then from 14 to 18, I got around my friend's family uh, because I don't have any friends from before the age of 14. All of my friends are the people I'm in high school uh, and, and the, the great people. And and I got to see their life. I got to see how they work. And, and, and I didn't really know that's what I needed to see. So I wasn't really looking up to them. The first person I consciously remember looking up to going, you embody traits that I want to carry and develop as my boxing coach. Uh and all of my boxing coaches, not just my my I happen to just spend the most time with Tommy and Keller, who's my pros, but my coach my entire pro career or and and the last parts of my amateur career. But but they all it, it was a very it was a culture. It was a culture of people trying to push themselves to be better. And I said, I want to be, I want to have the work ethic like you. I want to be able to teach like you. I want to be personable like you. I was able, I was seeing a different uh you, you see people doing something constructive and you go, I want to be like that. And I think that's cool. Yeah, I would imagine that's what kids do. They look at their parents and they go, Oh, you guys seem to be doing okay. I want to be just like you. Because I don't really know any better. And kind of the job of being good parents is, is you know, to make that not know any better be something good as opposed to something, you know, wicked. But but my um my, my boxing coach in particular, Tom Yankello, that's that's like uh who my role model is, man. He I I I watch a lot of what he does with his family and his career and his dedication to the fighters and his dedication to his craft. Those things all inspire me. No, I love to hear that, uh, especially, I mean, coaches are so important in even just combat sports, not just from doing it, but as a coaching in life, because, you know, it's, it's as you're explaining, you know, it's a pattern in a way of thinking and doing that flows over into all aspects of life. And, you know, through fighting, it's almost, you know, kind of personified into a pattern. And like you said, that culture and, Absolutely. you know, it's, it's. I hear, I've heard that a lot, not necessarily on the show, just, you know, from people in interviews and stuff, you know, just, you know, how important, you know, a, a martial arts or a sports coach was to a youth in, um, you know, finding and becoming who they were as an adult. Yeah. Because here's the thing, right? The best self-improvement is not anything that looks like the commercially packaged idea of self-improvement. The best self-improvement is, is trying to get better at something very specific that pushes you and challenges you, uh, that you need guidance, that you need patience, that you need diligence, that you need all of this to get through, okay? And boxing is, is, is just a perfect vehicle. I mean, I, and I actually say I don't think there's a much better self-improvement vehicle to, than combat sports. If you Now, you know, it comes with a high cost, but I believe the value you attain out of it uh, exceeds that cost, making it a worthwhile investment. And, and in doing that, you get exposed to a lot of people in a lot of different ways to be. And you get to see, you get to see what happens when you don't do well, when you don't, when you don't apply yourself, you get to see uh, what happens when you do, you get to watch the transformation of so many people, you get to watch people pick themselves up from being down. You get to watch people go through it's, it's the struggles and you struggle yourself doing the whole thing. And, and when you're doing that, you, you improve and you become inspired by the people around you. I think about some, you know, the, some of the best people I know I've, I've met all through, through fighting. What quality do you most admire in a woman? Um, bu- 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 um let me see. That's interesting. Um, generally, okay. If, if uh, generally speaking, I I tend to really value. Um, I'm trying to think about the best way to put this. If there's a word for it. Um, uh, I like to feel like I I have to earn her her niceness. I don't, you know, when everyone is uh, when a, when, a, when a woman is nice to you, I, I tell you, when a woman is nice to everybody, for no good reason, just you know, because of because of women and and what they are and who they are and how society kind of uh, the position they get placed in society. Uh, a woman who's nice to everybody is is like a it's like a guard dog that's friendly to everybody. 
that dog is fucking useless if he's friendly to everybody. Because his whole point is to guard. So he, if he if he likes you and only you, then that's a good dog because he's going to protect what you got. With you. He's, going to, he's going to hold down his purpose being there, right? You're not going to feel like you wasted your time and your energy caring for this creature, growing it, feeding it. And and then it just goes, oh, well, I like everybody. It's bad. Same with woman. Uh, I, I, I just think uh, it, a guy can't do everything. Uh, he can't, as he shouldn't, because there should be a level of um, faith and trust put in place. And the best way to make sure that's never an issue is, is there shouldn't be a question. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be like, okay, very, very nice and friendly that I got. I'm like, oh, well, why? I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying be ain't be me. Not saying that. But what I'm saying is, is, is outside of like professional circumstances, um, or, or like to my friends that I that I introduce, uh, then then what's the then there's really no reason for you to be be friendly with. with, with with just just guys, man. Like like on top of that, man. A lot of these weirdos, they don't know how to uh, deal with any type of engagement because every engagement leads to to them as an invitation uh, for some type of courtship. And then if you if you take it, you're trapped. If you don't take it, you're trapped. Uh, the point is, it's really hard being a woman. I, I you know I see a lot of. Uh, I see some videos where like guys pulling guns, man, because some girl said no. And I'm like, that's that's absolutely insane. So my thought process, the best way to protect that. Yeah. OK, and here's how I'll put it. Um, I, I figured out how to put it. And I hope this doesn't get you guys canceled. Um, the best uh, the, the trade I admire in a woman is when is when she lets the guy in her life protect her from the world and herself. Because women are too trusting and too connecting, and so that, and that that needs to be hardened out somehow. But but you don't want you don't want them to be hard. Uh, you just don't want them to be soft with everyone. That's all. And, and a lot of times, you know, an ounce of prevention is a, is worth a pound of cure. Well, to me, I always look at it as a great balance because on the flip side, I know I can be hard headed, and there will be situations where I'll go to my fiance Angie and I'll be like, "All right, so." here's how I'm thinking about this. Am I thinking about this logically? Like, does this make oh, right. sense? Because mate, cause I'm not sure I'm way too far over to this side and being an a-hole <laughs> and you know, half the time it's, yeah, you're being completely ridiculous. And it's like, yeah, you know, you might be right. Or the other time, you know, so I always kind of like that cause I know I can go way far to the extreme. So I love having that somebody being able to pull on me in that direction too. Yeah. You're right. Now, now what you're talking about, that is all of that stuff is, is super important. And, and, you know, and she's got to be there to, 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 to add. I mean, I, I say a good relationship should be like one plus one equals seven. And, and that's, that's really, mm -hmm. you know, it's certainly what it is in this house, but like but for all that matter, it's got to be protected. And I, I do what I can uh, to, to protect it. But the, the I think that the, the nature of, of, of just the the the, the friendly and nurturing and, and really a, a enticing appealing uh, of girls is that if you can find one who is who's able to make it clear in in behavior and demeanor that you know to other other gods in the area that this is not um this is not a house for sale that's for sale sign no way shape or form is up uh, it's a good thing <laughs> Yeah, exactly. A dog that uh, rolls over on its back for anybody is going to get pounced on in a negative way at some point. So, yeah, that's a you know that that's that that's a more cancelable way to say it than I said it. So you guys are good. <laughs> <laughs> what is the most courageous thing that you have ever done or seen in your life? Uh what I've ever done, have I ever been super courageous? Uh, you know, one time I was working at the bank. One of the many jobs I had, I worked at a bank. And we work at a bank, nothing glamorous about being a bank teller. It's just above minimum wage. Uh, and you have all these responsibilities. 
like like your till has to balance out every time. Even but even like, when a few pennies is a big deal. It's a rough rough job sometimes. But uh, for that reason, man, this guy came in drunk as a skunk. He wasn't in my line. He was down with my coworker, and he was being belligerent. And I, I can't remember what he said. Uh, but finally, I I had it. I said, and I, and I, I told him we don't right. That's what he said. Uh, she was he she couldn't do some more moving fast enough, and he was like, you know, we don't, you know, I, um, my business is, is this that or the other, and I'll take my business elsewhere. And I was like, man, take your business elsewhere, and you go on, guy. And then we we I started yelling at the guy and shoot him out. Then retrospect, man, probably maybe had a gun, whatever. Who knows, right? crazy but it was you know why do i consider it courageous uh because i really needed that job uh <laughs> you know at that point that and then they were well within their rights to fire me because customer service people cannot st- can't stand up for yourself and customer service sort of somebody putting their hands on you you can't do it and this guy wasn't there yet uh so so i, I remember that and i you know it made me feel good that that i um that i did that and and it, it that's important. Uh, I, I, but I, I don't think I have many like super courageous acts in my life because for the most part, I am I am not like uh, the closest I've ever come to being randomly courageous. Uh, somebody like like if somebody like somebody was um the hell was going on? Oh, I was in lives when I lived in L.A. Man, this is gone. This girl fighting in a subway downtown. The the few area you can get the subway in, in L.A. And I went to go, but like, hey, what's you know, what's going on? God flashes gun at me, like, back up, man. And I was like, cool, I don't want any problems. And then in a few seconds, they were they were cool again. And I and and you know, you want to talk about getting your perspective red pilled. If the, if he had shot me, uh, she had probably covered for him come up with an alibi, even though the subway cameras, you know, they they seen it was crazy and bad news. And and I would have walked away. So I really, you know, when when things are going on between people, I don't get involved. Uh if, if kids are in danger, that's when I get involved. That that, you know, unfortunately, fortunately I haven't seen something where like a kid needed some random help or anything like that. So kids, the elderly people who are in a powerless position. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if it looks like you got a choice and you're there, uh, I I want no parts of it, man. <laughs> and fortunately, I haven't seen anyone like be trapped in a vehicle and need some help or anything like that. So so um yeah, not, but but just just so you don't get the idea that I'm that I'm some kind of uh super courageous person no nah, I'll, I'll i'll let somebody uh, we have this argument all this discussion all the time i mean yeah she meet me and i'm like um so you know so if you see if you see some girl getting beat up uh you're not gonna like go say something to the guy like i'll call the police that is the farthest i'll go i will not get, not get involved no way <laughs> hmm. Yeah, the your bank teller story stuck a struck a chord with me because I was a bank teller for a number of years and yeah dealing with people especially because the part the part of town I was in wasn't wasn't the greatest and so the clientele wasn't the greatest either right so when people come in belligerent like that and and you know you're just trying to keep everybody safe behind the line especially when it's a coworker because. You know, there's not a lot of males that are bank tellers. I feel like it's more of a female. You know, now that you mention it, yeah, I was the only dude with the work there. Yeah, <laughs> never. I never thought about that. Yeah, my so. manager, the manager of the barons was a, was a guy. I was about it. Yeah, yeah, same here. So, and yeah, just I yeah. know where that's coming from. I've been in, in in a few robberies. I I wasn't the one that got robbed, but. It, it just always, you know, you feel bad when you, you, your coworkers getting harassed by someone that's belligerent. So I, I don't know. I probably <laughs> if, I can imagine how it felt to tell that guy off. Like, it probably felt great. I'm just going through it in my head. So I'm living like vicariously through you, I guess. <laughs> yeah, man, you know, what's cool. You know, this, this is where like so. So my general thought process is always if somebody starts a confrontation with me, they have a gun. Uh, because you, like when you look at me, I I do not make it, nothing about me says mm-hmm. easy target. Like nothing, 
not the way I talk, not the way I look. Like I like I got resting thug face, man. Like it's it's no no good. <laughs> I'm fucking, you know, what am I like? I was like 2.30 this morning, but I mean, I lift all the time. Nothing about me says easy target. So if somebody's willing to, like, re-engage with me, I'm like, okay, we're, we're, now I might have a problem. Uh, and this guy, fortunately, was not that guy. But, but you know, I, I think about this one time. I was, I was on my way to Best Buy. This is very clear in my memory. This was only a few years ago. So I'm on my way to Best Buy. I was in the middle of the summer. Um, parked my car, got up, was on my way into the, the store. Some 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 young skinny kid, he must have been like five, seven, five, eight, maybe. Couldn't have been more than 150 pounds. It was with his girl. She was dressed like a skank. This guy looked at me and said, the fuck is you looking at, man? And I said, nothing. And just kept on walking. Because my thought process is I'm looking at this guy. And he he right off jumped says something to me like that and i said okay best like 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 you this you're not stupid you're not gonna be with her with your girl so you can like get stomped on you probably yeah you kind of look thuggerish too so i'm gonna just let that go and just keep on not that not that i would like greet that with aggression anyway because you know what, what's the best that can happen we get into a fist fight uh and now i got an aggravated charge or something like that they were like nah man i Life is too short to go to prison. <laughs> Besides, you want the police any report for, to say anything. he punched the nice guy in the face who's right, speaking like, calmly. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't need that, man. You know, and that's one of the things like like uh, I, I really pride myself on the fact that when you get put when I get pulled over and nothing, nothing comes up in the system, you know, that, that that's not because I've been an upstanding citizen, you know, got lucky sometimes. That's it. I think a lot of people in jail. I wrote a blog post about this, about the odds of being pulled over uh, and then the odds of being pulled over while being drunk. And as funny as this sounds, you know, um, if you get pulled over while you're drinking, you're like you're the you're the unlucky one. I guess the opposite of I guess in, in the sense of the word, the cops are the lucky ones. That's that's what it is. Right. Um because they, it like never like statistically speaking, ba- the the number of people who drive drunk versus the ones that catch you you basically like they, it's, a, it's effectively not a crime. In fact, it's kind of crazy that so many people I know have one have a DUI because they, like they they shouldn't be able to catch them all, but <laughs> let alone even a small percentage of them. But but it's um it's it's a thing and it happens and I think about this all the time. And then uh, there's a there's a quote from from narcos he goes the bad guys have to keep getting lucky and the good guys only have to get lucky once and that's the the god honest truth when it comes mm-hmm. to any situation that, that that involves uh negative legal ramifications maybe maybe or, or even the potential like, like maybe that guy uh that guy, you know, tries a few other people and they're all calm like me. And then he goes off and does something psychotic anyway. Or or somebody, you know, man's up, man's up. And he does. He, you know, he pulls his gun or whatever he thought he had. And and then and now we got we got a crazy person off the street. Right. But but at what cost, man, everything comes at cost. I always think about this. No, I, what you say actually parallels back to some of the best advice I hearken back to. I had a long story short, similar to yours, just a lady claiming her husband was being abusive, get the police involved and she ends up leaving with him anyways. And it's like, okay. And the cop was like, listen, the less you get involved in other people's business, the better off you're going to be. And that really stuck with me because it was like, you know, if I don't have to get involved, like you said, you're an adult. And you look like you could leave, so I'm going to let it be, and that's it. No matter what you say to me, you have more control over the situation than I do. So I I, I have no ego and no pride here, no one no one to impress. I'm just like, look, I don't, you know, if you think less of me for not getting involved. But that's the thing, that's, like, because I used to okay. think I used to think that way until I really started seeing that I'm actually negatively affecting this entire thing. My involvement 
aside from wasting my time and getting me anxious, is negatively impacting these people and their situation and what they're doing. And ultimately, it's just no good for everybody involved. And if I had just seen that, I could have just let that energy stay over there and work in its own way and register, like you said, yeah, there's not a person, you know, not in power, in danger. If that situation comes up, I'll act as my instinct sees fit. Yeah. Um, but it's, I think it's, it's good advice for just everybody, even for just, you know, finding a, a way to move into the, through the world without conflict, you know, cause it's almost like you're seeking it out by trying to be helpful when you didn't have to be. Yeah. Just, you know, just, just let it, let it, the, the world's gonna, the world's gonna not know, or not even this, I guess the bigger point is like, we see a small portion and that portion is what we decide to react to. And very often, that is not even close to accu- an accurate representation of the, the bigger picture. And so if you, you react to this small point, you, you ruin your life uh, for what? Somebody who's going to, uh, or for, for something that, that just literally will mean nothing. <laughs> like you know, if I, like when I go, if I, if I like if I go in an act of valor, I like to think that I saved the kid's life or something. Not that I just that I separated a happy family that or a dysfunctional family because he's got to go away for five years for for, for for doing something. But what does it mean to be a man in today's world? In today's world, man, same thing as always, man. Right. The difference is that it's a lot harder to do it. Um, when you, you know, back in the day, you know, the masculine virtues and, and what I consider masculine virtues are pretty much the ability to resist. And through that resistance, either develop strength or, or to um, or, or, or to diminish the strength of the thing that uh, is trying to move your position. Uh, I'm real big on on defining things, man. So that that's probably one of the more precise ones I've come up with. But that that, that I, I think if you look at all things considered masculine, they they have that in common, whether it be psychologically, mentally, uh, physically, or emotionally. It's the ability to resist stress and and in doing so strengthening yourself through it and and uh weaken the thing that is trying to to you know cause you cause you to fall you know this is why like experience you know this experience is not the same on women as it is on men and on top of that you know women are physically weaker than us they cannot resist as much mentally their strength is in connection it is not in destruction um, at least not uh, intentionally, anyhow. And and if a woman destroys, you know, your your psyche, that that's a frailty on your part. So so that's that's generally what I consider what being a man is, right? The ability to resist. Now, what's gotten difficult today is that to develop this trait that makes you a man, you need to put yourself through difficult things. This is the only way strength is built. Strength is built by by doing a thing that you thought you couldn't do that was just outside of your comfort zone and you you adapt you adapt to stress and you become a little better a little stronger well this world is very easy uh and very comfortable um not a lot of you know we're we're approaching now i guarantee by by, well i don't even have to make a guarantee based on the numbers and the trajectory by 2025 we will be at 80 percent obesity in the united states that is, that is and if it's not by then it'll definitely be by 2030 so physically we're not strong now everyone has has a safe space and and competition is frowned upon or not or rather is not encouraged everyone wants they the the quick um Everyone wants a, wants a very quick outcome. And, and when, I, when I say that, I say everyone, meaning uh, most people, not all, and quick outcome, I mean what they see in someone's Instagram story as opposed to 
because remember, we didn't have the Instagram stories coming up. You know, you just kind of worked hard and got to it. Uh, we didn't have in general this idea uh, these things flow. Like, like, there was always consumerism, but now it's like in your face all the time. And people seeing it, talking about it. And, you know, I might even be guilty of, of participating in the hustle culture in terms of propagating uh, what you can acquire. The difference is, I'm, you know, I'm 36. You know, I was building my life mostly, not waiting for it to happen. And now, you know, what I show, I show some trips I go on. It's not like I'm, I'm blinging out on the gram. But my point is that nothing today uh, encourages encourages one to be strong uh encourages encourages a man to to face challenges and difficulty instead you know it's internet porn is it's fast food and garbage it's netflix and chill you know think of something about something real basic man i remember when when i was you know in high school calling girls i had to call the house well calling girls first of all that's a thing that doesn't happen uh so, so you're not getting that that psychological stress and then you have to you know talk to her parents and and be approved to to conversate and these things don't don't occur anymore now it's just sliding dms and and talk to over social media so we we've removed the psychological stressors the thing is life is still stressful so so i'm sure it's no coincidence that in fact, I think there was an article that talks about this, um, that, that around right around 29, bleh, 20, 2009, 2010, college freshmen started showing up uh, into the psych ward, or not psych ward, the um, the infirmary, I guess, of, of the colleges and, and, and the health services for mental health because the stress, they're not used to the stress. All of a sudden, you, you can't just... You know, you can't just throw three plates on the bar and throw it up. You got to got to train to do it. And you, that that <laughs> jump and stress was like just throwing three plates on the bar and you don't live. It's craziness. You and and, and there are numbers and, and all this. I could, I could just go on and on about this, this idea. Uh, when I did a basic training, they were talking about since 1985, the number of injuries sustained in basic training has been fairly uh, linear in its increase. And the thing that happened in the 1985, they, they call it, that's like when Nintendo came out. And it's like, it's like getting even worse because no one is spending time challenging themselves and working hard. And, and it's very easy now. I, I made a joke back early, like years ago, I made a joke that you know, all you need to do to be the man is have an apartment, Netflix, and a box of wine. And like now that, that's, that, that was a joke, mind you. And now very much, uh, cause, because with, with weaker men, there are lower standards. Uh, but that just means stronger men benefit. I mean, uh, I, like, like in my, and I do it because I understand the, the implication of everyone being, being, you know, a functional guy, understanding how it's important. But at the end of the day, you know, the ones who, who want to get after it, man, the pie is big enough. The, the the pie is so big and no one's chewing on it because no one no one challenges themselves anymore. That's that's really well said, and that kind of rolls into a theme of one of the bonus questions. So if you have a few minutes, we've got like yeah, two of those. Yeah, man, in I'm here. Yeah, Just, freedom. Remember, right? <laughs> <laughs> the the first one comes from actually a past guest of the show named Carpo. He messaged us through the Discord, and it's not really. A question, but it's so it's it's so much just discussing the rites of passage for for young men uh, and rites of passage because you yeah so 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 here here you know the like I said not really a question of thought I will tell you this uh, I don't feel like I went through a rite of passage uh, growing up I didn't have it what was it going to be so so what were my rites of passage there there are three incidents in particular that I remember making a big difference in my life one is when i got into boxing it's huge because because now i'm in a thing and there's like me boxing is training kind of so i mean fighting sucks like let's just call it what it is uh it sucks but but the way i think i wasn't gonna leave because it sucked so which is like kind of the whole idea of right of passage you can't just leave all right you gotta you gotta pass <laughs> and so i just stick with it and then develop and then do well okay so that's right of passage number one right of passage number two is somewhat related to boxing 
or at least Cosmo Boxing. When I was uh, when was this? Two thousand and ten. Yeah, no, two thousand and eleven. That's when it was. Two thousand ten, two thousand eleven. When I first started training with Tom at the near end of my amateur career, uh, he really got me in shape, and and I won the state title. Then I went and won the national, or, or not won one, but competed at the national level. And and because of my performance there, I got recruited by this group out in Los Angeles called All American Heavyweights. They were training former Division One athletes tournament to to heavyweights. And I wasn't a Division One athlete, but uh, I, I beat their guy that they had put the most money and time into. Who ultimately, Dominic Brazil. If you're familiar with boxing, he went on to represent us in the Olympics and uh, to fought for the world title twice. I think he's done now, just doing commentary. Uh, but in that, I I went from having this this kind of relatively mediocre existence by anyone's measure to being, but it was comfortable to being put in a very uncomfortable place. I had no friends, no money. Well, I had some. Well, I had money. Um, I actually had the most money I had for a long time until recently, um, in the past few two three four years. Uh, but I didn't know anyone around. My license was suspended, not because of anything related to alcohol, thank goodness. But I didn't have a car. I was kind of stuck in Carson, California, away from everything I knew that was familiar, and just train every day. And that was the first time I'd ever been whisked away. I tried through college the first time when I was like eighteen, but there was no. But I wasn't emotionally ready, and I had a way to run back. All right. There's, so that's right of passage number two. Third right of passage is getting sober. Okay, so what do all these things have in common? I I put myself in in difficult things where the the de- the definition of success would change me. There's there like there's no way to succeed and not be different. Okay, there's no way to have a successful boxing career and be the guy who didn't box. There, there's no way I was going to go to Los Angeles and come back and have. A, I mean, I guess I could have wasted a year and been in the same position, but I went out there and won a national title and really and really learned how to fight and really changed my life and made friends and network. Uh, getting sober, eh, my life is completely different. But but these rites of passage, you need a rite of passage. If you're looking to find a rite of passage, uh, you can't pick your rite of passage because you're not I mean. You're either going to go overboard or you're going to, it's not going to be underwhelming, uh, but it needs to be something that challenges you and forces you to change to succeed. And there's tons of things for it. I mean, a lot of guys, man, the best thing they can do realistically is go join the Marines. Just get through Paris Island. You'll be all right. And if Paris Island's too much for you, just join, join, um, join the army. Don't do the air force. Uh, I don't know enough about the Navy to say anything, but but those two two environments, but especially Paris Island, uh, or whatever I don't even remember the one over in San Diego is called. There's two different boots, but uh, that, that, that's a good rite of passage. Now for me, it wasn't a rite of passage because at that point I had already been separated, I already you know fought at a high level. It wasn't really uh, right. I just went. I, I did it because I needed money for school, but that um, but that would be a great rite of passage for a lot of guys. So does that, I guess that kind of rolls right into the second question I had in mind, and that's if you could give one sentence of advice to future generations, what would it be? And so I guess in order to do amend hard that, things that I was going to say in order to amend that, like besides, you know, enro- uh, enlisting, like what else? Man, like, what look, other j- advice, right? You, you need to look you t- like, like when you wherever you're at 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 16 17 because we're like i'm not the same person i was 16 17 right but wherever you're at at 16 17 take a take a hard look at your weaknesses and your strengths and attack it but, but because no matter where you're at at this point uh you're just not as strong as you will be and you're not and your weakness can be fixed but but you need to go attack something that you're unfamiliar and uncomfortable with and start building that habit as quickly as possible. Because the sooner you do that, the better off you're going to be because life is just full of these events that you cannot predict. And this is if you're trying to do anything. Yeah, I mean, if you're just going to you know, go work at your basic job and and and, and never leave you the shell, uh, you won't encounter these events, but you don't want to live like that. But life is just full of these events, man. They're going to like, push you and you're not going to be prepared for them so you need to get used to being unprepared and and running into that that surprise wall and then how you're going to balance but how you're going to figure it out so but that's what i would say you know just 
get used to pushing yourself through uncomfortable stuff. That's why people don't go to the gym because it's uncomfortable. Like, like, no, like I've never met a single person who would not like the result of going to the gym, like the outcome. It's that process. That's a motherfucker, man. And, and sticking with it for, for as long as you have to. Yeah. They, they, and, and I'll tell guys all the time, fighting is, is the best thing I think you should do. But if you, for whatever reason, can't do it, try and get your body fed down sub 14%, get your BMI up above 27. That, that, that is more than enough to push most guys uh, <laughs> to, to do something difficult uh, and outside of what their comfort zone is, especially if they, they are from a typical American household with a typical American diet and life and, and activity level. Yeah, Good that's a advice. it's a crazy systemic thing. I I, I love when I uh, will go running into the grocery store or something just because well it's free exercise and I can run and people look at you like you're crazy or going to jump them and I'm like you move really slow and so <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm just fascinated by this you know just systemic of not doing waiting outside for rain to pass instead of just walking out and it's a fascinating world we live in. You know, if people from like 200 years ago were to see those simple behaviors, they would think they were like, absolutely insane. What are you guys insane. doing? What do you mean? What do you mean? The food comes to you? I had to stock it. <laughs> <laughs> they drive it to you in bed. It's crazy. Yeah. Do Do you have one? I got one more question for you, if you get the time, and then we'll yeah, go. We'll do yeah. plugs. Okay. What institution of society or structural aspect of modern life would you change given the chance? What wow, man? So, so, oh, this is tough. I got, I got uh, two things came to mind immediately, but I think if we fix one, it'll fix the other. I would reduce the amount of time you need to, to spend in school. And I would change what you study completely. They, they, you know, once you understand what the purpose of school is, then what they teach makes a lot of sense. But if you look at school as a thing that's supposed to somehow like foster creativity and brilliance, yeah, you get confused about the subjects that teach him. School is not supposed to prepare you for the real world, it's supposed to make sure you, you are dependent on it. And the moment you recognize that, uh then it makes perfect sense why they still have you learning this look man i study physics i love math but nobody needs to know the pythagorean theorem this is the for what remember they used to tell us they said you're never gonna have a you're not gonna have a calculator with you all the time wrong not, not only do i have a calculator got a translator got a <laughs> i got a damn voltmeter on this thing a radar um uh, an instantaneous communication device the world's changed well, that's the trick, right? You, you got tricked into figuring that the answer wasn't important. It was how you do it, which is, like you said, it's how do you interface with the system and how do you do what we tell you to do? You right. Know, it's a great way of uh, conditioning. And and once, you know, th there are a few people who get it, but most people, based on my conversations, don't. I mean, it's not. And 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 all that means is that the, that it's done its job. That's it. What what is What does Morpheus say in The Matrix when he's... um? When he's showing Neo like the the programs or any, and it's like the woman in the red dress at that point, and he goes, you know, you know, we're here to to help free these people, but you have to understand, Neo, you know, everyone here is so so helplessly inert uh, inert on the system that they're gonna do anything uh, to protect it, and including you know, to try to kill you, right? Like all it means when people don't recognize how flawed I think our education system is an approach to it. I don't, and I don't care how good it is. Anything that's teaching irrelevant stuff that you can look up on your phone now, because that, that's kind of how the real world works anyway. Uh, it's, it's a waste of time. Now, part of that reason why this still sustains itself is because to, to pull your kids out and teach them what you think you should know. And I think there's a lot of kids. I think there are some parents who at least, no, they, they might not know what the solution is, but they know that this ain't it, but they don't. But, but it's like, what's the best option? We both got to work. Well, well, in mass, if enough, you know, women started like staying home or, or and they didn't even got to be women. I just think it would like 
make the most sense. But but whatever God's want to stay home too. But like whatever it is, having the workforce cut it right in half so that the people who do work make twice as much, and then someone stand home with the kids, and that would eradicate childcare. But but no one wants to have kids anymore. Technology is kind of uh, ruined that. Well, but, in the societal savings of just having kids with parents and what that's going to do for, you know, oh, social oh, issues, no, crime yeah. and mental like <laughs> health. Yeah, of, you know, we're talking. What are we talking about? Here? We're talking about making a no, making a functional society. Yeah, let's make a twenty-year investment into fixing ourselves on a fundamental level and bringing family back. Well, but here's the thing, I you know I well, maybe not obviously, but I one hundred percent agree. Uh, but I also understand the uh, the problem are the people who would be designed to benefit. They're going to fight it more than anybody. Have you ever tried to talk to a woman and get her to understand that, like, you really can't have both? And the people that do have both with a long career and a family are, are, are effectively like unicorns. Try to get someone to understand that. Try to get a young man to understand that talking to girls in person and trying to start a family instead of just pursuing casual encounters is the best thing for it. Like, like one of the things that will really change and make his life great. I mean, I think why I, we didn't talk cover too much here because it just happened around the period of my sobriety. So I kind of group all of these activities together in 2013. But, but I'll tell you one of the biggest, one of the huge things, the other part of that was me and Anna, uh, and, and not because like she she's like part of the business or anything like that, but but being what a what a solid constructive woman allowed look freed up all that time and energy I was spending you know chasing low quality low quality girls and allowed me to focus on building something and making a great life. Try to get a young man to understand that it's not going to happen, and 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 it's going to be very difficult. Even if he doesn't understand, it, it would be difficult for him to, to to fulfill that because of the values of of culture. We we're, we're just we're we're in a rough spot uh, collectively as as a society for the future, and I think what's going to happen is that they're going to be a lot of a lot of not a lot. Uh, I, but I do think a sizable minority is the best way to put it. A sizable minority of people who get it understand and have been preparing for it, and their kids are going to be set up, and they're going <laughs> to um, they're going to be the elites of the future. But everyone else is going to be like, "Why well, are the elites called it all of this?" And they'll, but there'll be a few to get it. But I think that's how it always is. How it's always been. We just notice it more now because we have these 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 devices and this technology that lets us see it. Well, Ed, thank you so much for spending time with us this evening. Um, before we let you go, is there any anything you want the listeners or you would like to tell the listeners about uh, your projects? You've got a lot of things going on. Um, uh, you know, just just follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and visit my website, and I'll make it real easy for you. I'm Ed Lattimore everywhere. Ed Lattimore on Twitter, Ed Lattimore Instagram, website is edlattimore.com, Facebook is Ed Lattimore, Instagram, uh, our Facebook um, messenger, uh, our business page is, is Ed Lattimore Boxer. That's the only one that's a little different. But I'm just Ed Lattimore. Type it in, you'll be able to find me, and I, I, I do my best to respond to everyone. Because at the end of the day, I'm extremely grateful. My life is really only possible because everyone else thinks it's so cool. Yeah, you got great, great SEO on that. And uh, made a name for yourself for sure. Thank you very much, so, man. Thank you. Uh, again, like Bill said, Ed, thank you so much. Thank you for giving us your time and your wisdom. Hey, no problem, man. Thank you guys for having me. I don't wanna hold my name. 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 I
I know one I hope when they know what's one man rich and another man poor Why we ain't satisfied, why we gotta have more Why your suicide rates on the rest so high Why I tell you the truth but you say don't lie Why is being a good father at an all time low Why is it acceptable, yo, why I don't know Why she blame him and he blame her, it's useless Ask yourself this question, why you making excuses Why do parents gotta bury their kids Why we text and drive, not caring how scary it is why it's so hard to forgive and leave the past behind And if you did, then that's divine Why don't you help your brother when you see him fall Why do we act like God don't see it all Why do we call them black, them white, them Asians and use labels Now that's racism I don't wanna how I lay Why? I don't wanna how I lay Yo, why? I don't wanna how I lay Why? I don't wanna how I lay Yo, why? I don't wanna how I lay Why? I don't wanna how I lay No, why? I don't wanna how I lay Why? I don't wanna how I lay No, why? Why is it innocent people locked up for life? While some people can't say nothing nice Why do we always gotta question what all of it means? And why won't you follow your dreams? Tell me why The night when you took my dad Why'd you let me see my grandpa cry? And tell me why and why do you choose to hide, even though you was born to fly? And tell me why, and why don't we turn from all the hate? And why don't we learn from all mistakes? Why do I keep on wrecking these fat beats? And teachers don't make more than professional athletes. And why, and why, and why, and why, and why, and why? And why? And why? I don't wanna how I lay. I don't want no hope I lay, yo, why? I don't want no hope I lay, yo, I don't want no hope I lay, yo, why? I don't want no hope I lay, yo, I don't want no hope I lay, yo, why? This should be considered entertainment and not therapy. We hope you benefit from our resources available at 13questionspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.